I think you would find it helpful to have your Bible open at the second chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. For four Sunday mornings, we are thinking about four of the central themes of a biblical gospel. They are biblical repentance, biblical faith, biblical salvation, and biblical holiness. And this is the third of these Sundays, and so our theme this morning is biblical salvation. If one were asked what was the key word of all words of a biblical gospel, I should think that it probably would be this one, because the Christian religion is basically a religion of salvation. The Christian gospel is basically a message or good news of salvation, and that is what it is concerned with fundamentally. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, says Paul in Romans chapter 1, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. What then is biblical salvation? The word needs to be liberated, I think, from the narrow confines in which it has sometimes been misunderstood. And I want to do that a little, first of all, because salvation, you see, is not simply another word for forgiveness. It includes that, but is infinitely broader and bigger than forgiveness. It is not another word for conversion either. In the Bible, it really describes God's total plan to restore man into his own image. And it includes at least three phases or tenses encompassing the past and the present and the future. You are bound to have heard of the Salvation Army girl who happened to be traveling in the train in a, the same compartment as Bishop Westcott, who was a great Greek scholar and a godly man. And the Salvation Army girl finding herself in one of these old-fashioned compartments you don't get very often nowadays with a bishop across from her thought that the opportunity was too great to let pass. And she plucked up her courage eventually and said to the bishop, Bishop, I have a question to ask you. And he looked over his glasses and she said, Are you saved, Bishop? And the bishop, who had been reading his Greek New Testament, said to her, Now, my dear, do you mean Sothais or Sodzomenos or Sothaizomenos? What the Salvation Army girl answered is not recorded, although I could imagine that she probably wanted to say to him, come off it, Bishop, you're dodging the question. But in fact, the Bishop wasn't dodging the question, although he certainly wasn't being very lucid and possibly not very kind. He was actually answering the question in a completely biblical way, for he was giving the girl the three tenses of the New Testament word for saved. And these three tenses are the key to biblical salvation. Salvation with reference to the past. Do you notice in verse 5 of our passage, Paul says, By grace you have been saved. Salvation with reference to the past describes the work of God's grace by which we are delivered from guilt and judgment, pardoned for all our transgressions, reconciled to God and adopted into his family. And this is salvation in the past tense. Salvation with reference to the present describes our continuing transformation 
by the inward work of the Holy Spirit into the image of God, a process which goes on through all our days as believers. We are being changed, says the Apostle, from glory into glory, into the same image, that is the image of Christ, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that is salvation. Salvation is that present work which is going on now of our being changed into the image of Jesus. Salvation with reference to the future describes the final completion of our deliverance from all the damage that sin has done. And that will come on the day when Jesus returns in glory, when we are delivered not only from sin's penalty in the past and from sin's power in the present, but from sin's very presence, when we are given new bodies in which to worship him and translated into a new heaven and a new earth. Now, says the Apostle, is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now, what does he mean by that? Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. He means that the fullness of our salvation is still to come. And there is a sense, of course, in which we do have full salvation here in this world. But there is another sense in which we will not have full salvation until we enter into the glory and Jesus comes to set up his dominion. Now I want us this morning to notice these three tenses. It's very significant that these three tenses of salvation are related to the three great events of our Lord's saving career. Salvation with reference to the past is related to our Lord's death by which he procures our freedom from condemnation and guilt and judgment. Salvation with reference to the present is related to our Lord's resurrection and his subsequent gift of the Spirit. And it is the power of the risen Jesus working within us by the Holy Spirit which enables us to see our lives transformed. And salvation with reference to the future has special connection with our Lord's return in glory. So these three great events of his saving career, his death, his resurrection, and his return, are linked to the three tenses of salvation. Now I want us to look a little more closely at this passage and at the nature of biblical salvation as Paul expounds it for us. And I want to do so by emphasizing four prepositions which go with the word salvation in Scripture. The prepositions from, by, in, and for. Salvation is from something. Salvation is by something. Salvation is in someone. Salvation is for something. And I want us to look at these as they are taught to us in this passage mainly. And the first thing that I want to draw from the passage is that biblical salvation is salvation from sin. To be saved in ordinary language means rescue. And we use the word, of course, every day. We are constantly speaking about the doctor who saved a patient's life, about the fireman who saved someone from burning, about someone who is saved from drowning, about the mountain rescue team who saved someone from perishing. And in secular use, the word means what it means in the Bible to rescue from the results of some deadly peril. And that's the biblical use of the word salvation. And in biblical terms, the deadly peril is the peril of sin of which Paul speaks in chapter 2, verse 1. You have been saved by grace, he twice repeats throughout this passage. And in verse 1 he tells us what we have been saved from. You he made alive 
when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Now, Paul speaks of this salvation in several different ways. First of all, we are saved from sin's penalty. You will notice in verse 1 of Ephesians 2 that sin is associated with trespass. And trespass carries with it a penalty. And the penalty or wages of sin is spiritual and eternal death. That's what Paul is arguing at the beginning of Ephesians 2. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And this is the deadly outcome of sin. Death in the Bible, you see, is a judgment. Physical death is a judgment upon man as a result of sin. And it is a sacrament or outward symbol of that deeper death, which is spiritual death, which is the outcome of sin. And beyond both physical and spiritual death, there is an eternal death which speaks of the separation of man from God forever. And this is the penalty of sin and its judgment. And from this, Christ in his mercy saves us. And salvation in the New Testament is salvation from spiritual death as the penalty of sin. And the gift of God is that I am freed from paying this dread penalty and given eternal life by his grace. So salvation is salvation from sin's penalty. And we are able to say in the light of it, no condemnation now I dread. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But it is also salvation from sin's bondage. Did you notice in verses 1 to 3 of Ephesians 2, the three uses of the word following in the Revised Standard Version? He made you alive when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And then at the end of verse 3, following the desires of body and mind. Now that is a way of describing the threefold bondage into which sin brings men. So often people think when they are in the midst of rebellion against God that they are the people who are free. But what the apostle is pointing out to us is that sin brings with it not only a dread penalty, spiritual death, but it brings with it a deadly bondage. And that bondage is described by Paul as threefold. It is a bondage to the world, to the devil, and to the flesh. Do you notice in verse 2? Following the course of this world. That's the first bondage. And the picture of this word following is of man being led around, not as a free agent, but he is being led around in chains. And the bondage is bondage to the course of this world. You can see that in all sorts of ways, of course, can't you? We discover it in our own lives, the reality of this bondage to the world and its fashions and its dictates and its standards. And there are so many people who are wandering around Glasgow today imagining themselves to be free and they are in total bondage to the world. There is a deeper bondage, however, following the prince of the power of the air. And that is the bondage in which, into which sin brings us to Satan, whereby we are his captives and under his dominion and slaves of his whim. And that is the picture the Bible gives us of man in sin. We are in bondage to the world, in bondage to the devil. And do you notice in verse 3, in bondage to the flesh? Among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. And God in his mercy has provided for us a salvation 
that delivers us from sin's bondage. And we need to grasp this, beloved, that the salvation God has given us is not simply from sin's penalty so that we no longer go to hell. The salvation he has provided for us is something greater than this. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. And he breaks the power of the bondage we are into the world. He breaks the power of the bondage to Satan. And he breaks the power of our bondage to the flesh and its dominion. But there is something even more serious that we are saved from. We are not only saved from sin's penalty and from sin's bondage. Paul tells us at the end of verse 3 that we are also saved from God's wrath. Following the desires of body and mind, and so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, has saved us. That's what he's going on to say. And we have several times discovered that the thing that makes sin most serious of all is that it brings down upon the sinner the active wrath of a holy God. And biblical salvation in the miracle of God's mercy is salvation from that. So salvation is salvation from sin. But secondly, biblical salvation is salvation by grace. Verse 5 states this and verse 8 amplifies it. In parenthesis, Paul says we were made alive together with Christ and he explains this, by grace you have been saved. And in verse 8, he amplifies it, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now, wherever you find the Bible speaking of salvation, it universally speaks of it in these terms as something God does for man which he is totally and utterly incapable of doing for himself. Not only so, but it is something God does for man to which man cannot contribute anything. It is the gift of God and you do not buy a gift or contribute to it. It is a gift from God. Archbishop William Temple. We really are on the bishops and the archbishops this morning, aren't we? Archbishop William Temple put it beautifully when he said, The only thing that a sinner contributes to his own salvation is the sin which makes it necessary. Beloved, the sooner we learn that, the more we will learn to magnify the grace of God and enter into the deepest truths of what God has done in Jesus Christ to save us. The only thing we contribute to our own salvation is the sin which makes it necessary. Now, there are two reasons why salvation is by grace and not by works. And the first is, because as a sinner, if I stand before God on the grounds of anything that I have done, I call upon myself his swift judgment. Because I am by nature as a sinner unable and incapable of pleasing God and keeping his law. And God's demands are that I keep the whole of his law. And if I fail to keep it in one part, then the judgment of God is called down upon my disobedience and transgression. So the primary reason that salvation is by grace is because of man's inability, because of the sin which has destroyed the possibility of man being able to please God. 
I have offended against God's law. Every one of us here in church this morning has to acknowledge this. And not only so, but we are unable and unwilling to keep it perfectly. My deepest problem, you see, is that I have a will which is inverted and perverted against God and his law. And I do not deep down, apart from God's grace, even desire to keep it. So salvation is by grace and not by works because of man's inability. But secondly... Salvation is by grace and not by works because the idea of earning salvation simply panders to the pride which is endemic in man and hateful to God. Do you notice in verse 9, not because of works lest any man should boast. That's a great theme of the apostles. He says salvation has been contrived by God in such a way that the thing it hits hardest is human pride. Listen to Paul in Romans 3 verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? He is expounding justification by grace through faith. What becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On the principle of works? No, but on the principle of faith. For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And boasting is excluded. Pride is killed. Only by a gospel of grace. Now it is this exclusion of pride and boasting which makes salvation by grace alone offensive to natural man. It is an intolerable offense to human pride to have to cry, God be merciful to me, a sinner. To have to say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. That is offensive to man's pride. But it is the essence of the gospel, beloved. I was speaking in the vestry last Sunday morning to someone who comes from the Unification Church, which you will know better as the Moon sect. And we were talking about this. And he was saying to me, we believe salvation is by God's grace and what he has done in Christ and, and that is the fatal conjunction. Whenever you add anything to the grace of God, you have stepped outside of the Bible and what it teaches. And that is the subtlety of sects like that. And I counsel you this morning to resist their approaches. That is the danger. It is a denial of the gospel. Whenever you say grace and... You are denying the gospel and offending the cross and blood of the Son of God. Because there is nothing that we add. It is sola gratia. Grace alone. Salvation is from sin by grace. Let me briefly say to you it is also in Christ. Biblical salvation is salvation in Christ. Three times in this passage in Ephesians 2, from verse 6 to verse 10, Paul underlines that this salvation is to be found in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, he raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us, in Christ Jesus. And again in verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now that first of all means that God has decreed and declared that salvation is found nowhere else except in Jesus Christ. 
There is salvation in no one else, say the apostles in Acts 4.12. For there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but this name. And there is salvation to be found nowhere else but in Jesus. But it means also that salvation is found in Jesus as a person. It is therefore by coming to Jesus that we find salvation, not by coming to church or joining an organization or trying to conform our lives to a certain pattern, but by coming to Jesus. For there is no other name whereby we must be saved, but more specifically it means that salvation is found only in what God has done in Jesus Christ particularly in his death as our sin bearer. In Ephesians 2 and verses 13 and 16, Paul says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near in the blood of Christ. And God has reconciled us both to himself in one body through the cross. It was on the cross that Christ bore sin's penalty and God's wrath. It was through the cross that he dealt with principalities and powers and made an open show of them. It is his blood alone that cleanses from sin. So biblical salvation is salvation from sin, salvation by grace, salvation in Christ, and it is salvation for good works. I'm using Paul's phrase in Ephesians 2 and verse 10. We are his workmanship, he says. That is another testimony to the grace of God, of course. We are created in Christ Jesus. For what? Well, his answer is for good works. We are not saved by good works, you will notice. We are saved for good works. And this is biblical salvation. It is not a negative thing, you see. It is a positive thing. We are saved into a new life. We are saved for good works. And so Paul appeals in, in Ephesians 4, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all lowliness and meekness and so on. Now that's salvation, beloved. Salvation is what we are saved for as well as what we are saved from. And Paul is able to say, Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Salvation in that sense, you see, has just begun for us. And we need to grasp this ongoing process, changing our character until the day when we see him, and then we shall be like him. Salvation is for newness of life. But one more thing I must add before we finish. Biblical salvation is not only salvation from sin and by grace and in Christ and for good works, Biblical salvation is also personal salvation. It is not primarily the salvation of society, although it affects society profoundly. Biblical salvation is primarily personal salvation. It deals with you as a person and with your situation before God, with the problem of your sin, with the need of your life now this morning. That's what biblical salvation is is primarily concerned with. And so I want to end by putting to you the Salvation Army girl's question to the bishop. Are you saved? Have you experienced the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, not in your family, may I say, not simply in the church to which you belong or the tradition in which you've been brought up, but have you experienced the saving power of God in Jesus Christ in your life? Has it become a personal reality to you? And are you being saved this morning?
day by day from the bondage of sin. Are you able to lift up your heart in the knowledge that this work of God's grace which is going on will without question one day be consummated when Jesus comes again in glory and we shall be made like him. We shall close our service singing together a hymn that can be our response to God's word, number 685. Number 685, I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee, trusting thee for full salvation, great and free. 685.